Okay, um, you know, last week we didn't really get to the message that I had prepared for Mother's Day, and so I've taken the message and I've generalized it uh, in uh, form, but that you can see the many vestiges of it being a Mother's Day message. All right, I want to read to you uh, something that somebody wrote, and um, he, uh, he um, shares about his life and um, shares some very important thoughts. This is what he says. My mother was a domestic. Through her work, she observed that successful people spent a lot more time reading than they did watching television. So she announced that my brother and I could only watch two to three pre-selected TV programs during the week. With our free time, we had to read two books, each from the Detroit Public Library, and to submit to her written book reports. Sound fun? Anyway, she would mark them up with check marks and highlights. Years later, we realized that she, who only had a third grade education, was actually illiterate. This was a ploy by her. Although we had no money, between the covers of those books, I could go anywhere, do anything, and be anybody. Continuing, when I entered high school, I was an A student, but not for long. I wanted the fancy clothes. I wanted to hang out with the guys. I went from being an A student to a B student to a C student, but I didn't care. I was getting the high fives and the low fives and the pats on the back. I was cool. One night, my mother came home from working her multiple jobs, and I complained about not having enough Italian knit shirts. She says, okay, I'll give you all the money I make this week scrubbing floors and cleaning bathrooms, and you can buy the family food and pay the bills. With everything left over, you can have all the Italian knit shirts you want. Okay? Well, I was very pleased with that arrangement, but once I got through allocating money, there was nothing left. Uh, lost my place. Oh, I realized my mother was a financial genius to be able to keep a roof over our heads and any kind of food on the table, much less buy clothes. So I also realized that immediate gratification wasn't going to get me anywhere. Success required intellectual preparation. I went back to my studies and became an A student again. And eventually I fulfilled my dream and I became a doctor. Over the years, my mother's steadfast faith in God has inspired me, particularly when I had to perform extremely difficult surgical procedures or when I found myself face with my own medical scare. A few years ago, I discovered I had a very aggressive form of prostate cancer. I was told it might have spread to my spine. My mother was steadfast in her faith in God. She never worried. She said that God was not through with me yet. There was no way that this was going to be a major problem. The abnormality in my spine turned out to be benign and I was able to have surgery and am cured. My story is really my mother's story. A woman with little formal education or worldly goods who used her position as a parent to change the lives of many people around the globe. Now, you know this person's a doctor. Does anybody know or have heard this story and you have an idea of who I may be talking about? <laughs> okay, Phil. Who is Ben Carson? Well, he's now retired Bureau Surgeon Seattle University. He's also the author of Surgery 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 Surgery
when he was young, he had a violent temper. Uh, in the ninth grade, he nearly stabbed a friend over a fight about a radio station. Fortunately, the knife blade broke. Um, and, you know, he uh, started to read the Bible, and as he started to apply what he was learning from the Bible, it settled his temper, and his temper problems went away. And uh, when he graduated, uh, the, the name of his book is Gifted Hands, all right? He has a number of best-selling books. But he, his hand-eye coordination was so excellent above other surgeons who do very fine surgery. And he became the first doctor to lead a team of 72 doctors to separate twins who were conjoined at the head. Okay, I forget how many hours that took, but a team of 70, hour, uh, 70 doctors probably working for a day or more uh, in this surgery to do it. And so he attributes, and he calls the title of his essay, There is No Job More Important Than Parenting. And he's talking about the influence of parents in lives. And so we're going to be talking about using the example of another mother, but we're basically talking about how we are impacted by the influence of others. And if you notice how when he talked about what he learned, Dr. Carson, he learned about how uh, you didn't need money if you had the books. Uh, he learned about how immediate gratification wasn't the answer to life. And uh, he learned that through a kind of an experiment that his mother set up for him, you know. And then he learned about faith, faith in God through the mother. And so you see, some of his lessons were things that she actually taught him. But there's also another side of how he learned, the things that he caught, the things that we pick up just being around others. And now, through the research on the brain, they know, they know the power of subconscious learning through influence of others, that we have in our brains these things called mirror neurons, by which we see things even when we don't even know that we're paying attention. And so we pick these things up from others. And so the power of influence is very strong. And, uh, uh, physically uh, e explained now that we have the level of science. And so, uh, so this is how important it is when we talk about um, learning and changing and becoming uh, people, better people. Okay, so we're going to talk about a woman uh, whose name most people don't even know. I'm talking about Moses' parents, Moses' mother. Now, who knows the names of his parents? Yeah. Mr. and Mrs. Moses? No? Yeah, it's, it's, people never say it. It only appears twice. And it appears in some strange, out-of-the-place way. Okay, so I'm going to give it away. The father's name is Amram. Okay, that'll be easy to remember. And the mother's name is Jochebed. Okay, Jochebed and Amram. And uh, so we're going to turn to Exodus chapter 2, and we're going to read the story about the beginning of Moses' life. And I want you to put out of your mind all those cartoon pictures you saw that might have given you the wrong impression about what was going on. And we'll explain this as we go along. We're going to do the first 10 verses of uh, this passage. Now, let's begin. It says, Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. You know, and you're thinking, wow, God is kind of going out of his way to avoid mentioning 
who these people are. All right? And uh, so we come to verse 2. The woman conceived, all right? So she, they remained anonymous and bore a son. And I want you to notice conceived and bore a son. Again, it seems kind of redundant. Um, so God is writing in a kind of an interesting way here. And then it goes on. And then when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. And pay attention to the word fine, because we're going to come back to that. Um, you read it and you say, so what? Every parent look at their child, right? My, what a fine child, right? You're not going to look at your child and say, my, what an ugly child. Or an awful child. You're going to say, maybe expensive child, <laughs> but fine child. All right, so this is how it continues on. She saw that he was a fine child, and then it says, she hid him three months. As if one followed the other. Verse 3. It says, when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes. And she daubed it with bitumen and pitch. And she put the child in it and placed it where? But where at the river? Among the reeds, right? Half the pictures you see, this thing is floating down the middle of the thing. And then if you got an atheist version, you would have that ark, that little, um, this little um, basket floating right into the jaws of a what? If it was an atheist picture. What do they have in the Nile? Crocodiles, okay. So it was not like that at all, okay? So this thing is coming along. Uh, it's been put in there very deliberately in the reeds. Um, and um, his sister stood at a distance to know what should be done to him. Um, and here's, here's what's going on, because a lot of the stuff that's really going on in this passage is only hinted at through the wording. Now, go back to verse 2 where it talks about how the woman conceived and bore a child. Those words, conceived and bore. Throughout Genesis, what happens is this. This combination of words is used whenever somebody significant in God's spiritual line is to be born. And so throughout Genesis, as God is creating a people, moving from Adam and Eve to um, Abraham and on beyond to Joseph, this phrase is used to identify God's will, God's plan, God's control. And so here for the story of Moses, we get it one final time reaching past Exodus into Genesis to pull that phrase out to kind of say, you know, God is at work here. So that's the first hint we get. And then we get to the word, she saw that he was a fine child. And what happens is this word, and sometimes they're not sure how best to translate it without getting into a full explanation. Um, it's the same word that's used for good, as in Genesis 1. So that each day when God finished his work and he looked back at it, he said it was good. And when he got to the end, he says it was very good. And so it's talking about how God is carefully putting together something that he means to make into something big and spectacular. And so we see again that God is at work and he is controlling this process and she kind of senses it. And so she says, you know what? We've got to do something to protect this child. So the verse says, she hid him for three months. And uh, so 
The child is hidden, but it says when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket. And I gave it away earlier. What did I call this instead of calling it a basket? What word did I use? If you ark. It's the same word as for ark. Okay? And uh, so what's going on here is the idea as God saved Noah from the flood and from the destruction of all humanity through the creation of this ark for this special man and, this, and his family, God is going to do the same thing again. And he's going to use Moses to begin a new group of people. And so this whole thing is being laid out step by step. And the idea of it that the scholars uh, write about is more like this, because we see the sister waiting and watching. And the idea is, you know, you would have these Egyptian police, secret police, whatever, and they're coming around to check to see if any of the Jews had kept their children and hidden them and not followed the instruction to throw them all into the water. And so what they would do is set up this protective basket, this ark, and probably it was something covered and enclosed, and they would hide it. Because when they, they would come, they would hide it. But when they're gone, it would be easy to retrieve this ark and bring it back into the house. Or when the baby was needing feeding, you would bring it back. Uh, and so this way you have a versatile arrangement to continue to protect this child. And so that's why the sister was on guard, keeping watch, trying to decide what to do. Let me quote from um, a commentary, uh, the New International Version commentary. It says, the hiding is described with words of one keeping a treasure safe from loss and harm. They deemed the risk to be worthy, so they hid this child fearlessly. And uh, so this kind of gives us a very different picture of what's been going on all this time. And uh, so this brings us to the next phase, which is kind of a the parents have to let go and trust God phase, right? So let's uh, begin reading at verse 5. This is what Amram and who? Jochebed could not have planned for or control. Um, it says, Then the daughter of Pharaoh came, came down to bathe at the Nile, with her maidens walking alongside the Nile. And she saw the basket among the reeds, and she sent her maid, and she brought it, the maid brought it to her. So God causes Pharaoh's daughter to see this basket. Next verse. And when she opened it, she saw a child. And behold, the baby starts to cry. Okay? God's got this thing tied perfectly. Behold, the boy was crying, and he moves in her heart, unlike her father. And she has what? She has pity on this child. And she says, this is one of the Hebrew children. So she knows what's happening. She knows what she's getting into. And yet she is going very differently from what you would expect. Verse 7, then Moses' sister says to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Now this is some precocious little girl. We know from other verses that Aaron is older than Moses. He's three years older than Moses. We know that Miriam, the sister, is older than the two boys. She was born first. All right? And most people estimate she's probably somewhere between the age of seven and 12, when you would have to start going out into the fields to work as a slave. Think about it, seven to 12. 
Now, I look back when I was 7 to 12, and I was a dumb little kid, okay? I would not have had the presence of mind to come up with this statement at that critical moment. Maybe a week later, but not at that moment. Something totally unexpected happens. How could she have known that of all people, who were they trying to keep their eyes open for? The Egyptian police. Who should show up? Pharaoh's daughter. And yet, you know, she senses somehow that this woman has pity on him. Maybe she showed it with her face. Maybe it was the way she said this is one of the Hebrews' children. But at this young age, she has the calmness and the shrewdness of mind to come and make this offer. Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women? You know, I mean, maybe it took a lot of courage for her even to speak out at that point, right? Because in the presence of royalty, but you can get away with it as a little girl. Okay, so anyway, God gives her the words, perhaps, gives her the courage, perhaps. And so she speaks, and God has the Pharaoh's daughter agree. And this whole thing is happening out of anybody's control. Verse 8, and the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go ahead. Don't you think she should check with dad first? Direct violation of a very important order. But she says, go ahead. And so the girl runs, and what does she do? She calls the child's mother. So Jochebed comes in verse 9, and the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away, huh? And nurse him for me, and I shall give you your wages. And so Jochebed took the child and nursed him. Amazing outcome. Back to the way it was, but now no need to hide and getting paid for what she would have had to do anyway. Okay. Um, and, and God often does that. He causes the enemies of God's people to provide the provisions and the treasures. You remember when the children of Israel, the Hebrews and the mixed multitudes left Egypt? What did they take with them? for their new life. They took all the jewelry and all the good stuff from Egypt. They gave them these tributes to get rid of them, to pay them to leave. I was watching the news last night, and it talked about somebody who was renting her house on Airbnb. And uh, what happened was these people came in, and they started to trash the house, and they wouldn't leave. And uh, she hired an attorney to try to get them out, and she finally had to pay them 1700 bucks to get them to leave the house. Well, this is what's happening here, that, that God gets uh, others to take care of his people. And so we come to the final verse, and the child grew. And the word actually carries much more than that. He was nurtured, and he became greater and noble and mighty and... All of that, and then it says when he got to a certain point in his development, in other words, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him what? This is the first time we get a single name in this whole story. We don't get the parent's name. We don't get the Pharaoh's daughter's name. We finally get him a name. She said, because I drew him out of the water. Is this a Hebrew name or an Egyptian name? It's an Egyptian name. Forever we know Moses, not by his Hebrew name. I'm sure his parents had a Hebrew name for him. But I think God, to honor her compassion and her pity and him using her, she allowed that name, he allowed that name to stay as a name. And the scholars say, well, you know, Moses may have been around seven at this point. Perhaps younger, perhaps older, but around seven. And so 
at this point, he is turned loose. Well, you know, think about it. We don't know how many months after three months this whole thing happened, but we can pretty much guess maybe she had him for six or seven years. What can you do in six or seven years? And my title is First Impressions Last. Okay, they teach you when you go into business or when you go out in the world, always to be at your best, right? Because when you meet somebody, that first impression they have of you will last. Well, same thing with children, with human beings, with people. Those early years are the years when you lay a foundation. One of the pastor's wives in Pasadena wrote a book about raising kids, and she gave it a wonderful title. She said, children are wet cement. Now, guys, what, what, what impression does that give to you? What? Yeah, you can draw, you can shape, you can write messages into, you can do all kinds of things. But how long does that last? Not too long, because it will harden. And after it hardens, you know, you're going to have to break up the cement to change it. And so she says, children are wet cement. You lay that foundation, and it becomes so powerful. And the scriptures say that, right? Train up a child when he is what? Young. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And, and, and I acknowledge that during those teen years and the young adult years, when you're testing things out, you may seem to be even in rebellion against what you've learned. But when you get older, you revert to those foundations. And so you spring back to the shaping that you had. And they've done statistical studies. They say that spiritual and moral development, we recently had a speaker come to uh, explain these things to our children's workers. And these are some of the statistics that she gave, that spiritual and moral development begins as early as age two. So we're seeing foundations being laid. And then it says that these foundations are usually fixed by guess what age? Nine. So you got a seven year window between two and nine. And it says by age 13, we pretty much see the adult spiritual conditioning. Um, and uh, so they've done studies to see what happens later. And they say that between the ages of five and 13, children have the highest probability of trust for salvation. So if churches will work on bringing children to becoming Christians during those ages, you will have a 100% decision rate. Uh, after that, uh, it's a much, much harder. Um, and uh, after those teen years, it drops down to from 100% for to 6%. So can you see how difficult it is? Um, and if you train a child to worship, there's a 61% likelihood that they will, can do, they will do this as adults. But if you don't, then it's like 78% unlikely that they will not. So throw you some statistics. This is based on research. Back in the old days, the Chinese um, the Communist Chinese, the Department of Education, had this saying, that if you give me a child when he is young, I can shape him easily. But if you give me a child when he is older, I will have to bend and twist him. And then if you give me a child when he is beyond childhood, you know what they say? I will have to break him. Okay. And so it gives us a sense of how important it is 
those early impressions. Well, let me quickly talk to you about how these things worked in Moses' life. You know the story. Moses eventually identified as a Jew, not as an Egyptian. He could have chosen to be an Egyptian. Can you imagine the pressure, how easy it would have been for him to just stay Egyptian and to walk away? And how scary that is for every parent. I remember first grade of Chinese school. The first thing my Chinese school teacher taught us Chinese kids was to say, I am a person of China. Okay? She wanted to make sure if there was ever a war, and that's what she said, if there's ever a war, I want you to be able to say this. Okay? Because when you're young, you can lose track of this sort of thing. But in every culture, identity formation is the most critical thing of our lives. Whether it has to do with our place um, in the family, whether who I, we identify with of our parents or other relationships, uh, when we get older in school, whether we choose to hang with the jocks or with the nerds or with the uh, people who are popular, you know, we're always in that process, in that early stage of our life of deciding about our identity. And the fact that Moses on his own chose to defend a Hebrew slave against an Egyptian slave master and would risk his life over and again tells you how strong that identity was. And not just in that identity that she probably impressed on him, she probably told him, Moses, when I saw you, I saw that there was something special here. And I had a sense that God was leading us. And so against all my fears, I found courage. We found courage to protect you. And we have a sense that you were meant to be special. Not the specialness that every parent says to their children, but they had a spiritual sense of him being special. And I think that's why Exodus chapter 2, those opening chapters, uh, verses give us so many words to kind of describe that specialness. And so they were determined to protect them and give him a sense of his destiny. That he was perhaps like another Noah. And so these are things that they would teach him. But there were things that he would have learned by osmosis. Things that he would have caught he would have caught from his parents their sense of courage to be able to stand strong and have a great faith with parents like this as they shared those early days and how God delivered them. And I need to move quickly to some important things that I want us to know from this. One. We cannot say this to our kids, do as I say, but don't do as I do. They're going to catch it, our bad habits. If this is the way we are at home, this is the way they will be. If I'm lazy at home, my kids will be lazy kids. Okay? If I am always wasting my time, they will be kids who will waste their time. We just can't tell them otherwise. The imprinting is too powerful. Number two, we cannot impart what we do not possess. This is the other side of the coin. If I want my kids to be thrifty and to learn to save, I can't teach that if I'm not like that. If I'm spending freely and carelessly and always doing that, well, what are they going to learn to do? The same thing. And so whatever we want from our kids, 
we've got to work hard to possess it so that we can impart what we do possess. And so he learned faith, he learned courage, um, he learned the faith to trust God to do all the things he did. Uh, he learned uh, to have a purposeful courage that um, was uh, so difficult and needed in his whole life. So let me go to the end here. When I used to do baby dedications, I would come to the parents and I would say, before we dedicate your child, which is the first act of saying you're planning to disciple your child, I want you to think, how are you going to disciple him? And they always say, well, we'll bring him to church. That's good, OK? Better that the parents bring the kids to church than to do what? Send the kids to church, right? Uh, but I say, but you know what? What personal qualities are you going to impart? And I make them think through their personal strengths. I used to ask them, what qualities do you want for your child? And they would name all these qualities. And sometimes I would look at these qualities, and knowing the parents and how they grew up in the church, I say, this is going to be hard. You don't have any of these. You know, you cannot impart what you don't possess. So I finally went to say, what are your strengths? Tell me your strengths. OK? Uh, it's the same thing with companies. We write mission statements and values based on ideals we want rather than what's natural to the founder and to the CEO. You see? So anyway, they think it through. And they develop it, and they show it, and they talk about it. And then they're able to impart it because they possess it. But they become explicit about it. And then, what do you not want your kids to have of your bad habits? Think about how you're going to stamp those out in your home, in your work, in your life, all around. And so that's basically what we have them to do. And this happens in the family, but this happens in the church. Let me get very, very explicit without being judgmental. You know what? If more and more people start to show up late, guess what's going to happen? Pretty soon, everybody starts to show up late. Right? Uh, if everybody throws trash into the trash can when it's already full, whether it's trash from our lunch, I see people take a plate of food and balance it on top of plates that are already six inches above the lid of the trash can. Right? I'm thinking, wow, that's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty capable. Instead of taking it to an empty trash can or in the bathroom, same kind of stuff. See, we do impact one another. If we will work together and the kids are running around and we come to them and say, we need you to walk because we don't want you running into one of the old ladies or into a wall, okay? We will teach. We will influence. And so we can apply this. I can take it into your office because I've studied management and I've studied all that. But these are just more practical elements for us to learn. We are an influence, and we will all become better disciples together or worse disciples together. When Jerry tells me, Pastor, you guys forgot to light the light on the cross, he's made me a better pastor because he reminds me of part of our job here. Of course, then I told Jerry, well, you're such a good remembering, you know, remind me or go and turn on the light yourself. Okay, and we work together to improve, to grow. And so I urge that for our homes, for our churches, because we have influence. Regardless of whether you accept the role or not, we all are leaders. 
and we all are leaders that are influencing people around us. And by the way we behave, we're either good leaders or we're bad leaders. Let's pray. Father, we are not nameless people. We are named by you. You know us by name, and you call us by name. Each one of us has a special purpose and a special role. And I pray that we will each discover it, that we can be significant, and you want us to be significant. Help us to realize that we are all discipling one another. We are training one another. We are teaching one another. And we can do it with love and wisdom, or we can do it poorly. We can set good examples. We can set bad examples. Once again, teach us by helping us to see ourselves very clearly and to know ourselves very well so that we can deploy what is good for the benefit of all and we can stamp out what is bad, not only for all, but even for ourselves. So Lord, just impress in us many practical aspects that we need to know from this passage of your word. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.